Before I do that, just introduce myself. My name is Professor Ian Shaw. I'm Professor of Toxicology here at the University and Director of Biochemistry. I'm based in the Chemistry Department, so I tend to sort of err on the chemistry side, given half a chance. And if I do err too much on the chemistry side, you just slow hand clap, and then I'll go back again to something sensible. So let's kick off. One or two of the other things as well, I don't normally talk about myself because I don't do that, but I think one of the really important things about science is collaboration. And I just want to point out some of the collaborations that I have underway at the moment. Um, I'm part of Gravido, which is um, a group up in Auckland, uh, a, a centre for research excellence, which is where quite a lot of the sort of research I'm going to talk about today goes on. And I'm a principal investigator up there, so I have PhD students and have research people working with me up there, and I'm working with them. And we're very much involved in growth and development and the effect of diet on, on um, children. I'm also co-director of the Lincoln Canterbury Food Safety Centre, which is an important new venture funded by uh, the Tertiary Education Commission to try and bring the working of universities together. It's really important that we don't work in isolation, but that we work together. So just two of the things I'm trying to do that are collaborative at the moment. So I'm going to ask the question, what if... What do you eat controlled your children's genes? That's a huge question. And it's beautifully speculative because I love speculating. And when they said, will you come and give one of these what-if talks, I really leapt at the idea because it actually gives me the opportunity to speculate. So part of what I'll talk about is real science, but a good proportion of what I'll talk about is speculation. But I'll also put some evidence under that speculation just to show you that the ideas that are beginning to develop are moving into reality. Because in the middle of what I'm going to talk about, you'll think you're in a science fiction lecture. You're not. The three things that we need to understand, and I'm sorry for the biochemist sitting over there, we need to understand something about nucleic acids, something about chromosomes, and something about genes. So I'm going to give the three-and-a-half-hour crash course. I've lengthened this lecture now. Uh, three-and-a-half-hour crash course on nucleic acids, chromosomes, and genes so that I can begin to talk to you about what happens when things go wrong with these. And that's really the basis of what I'm going to talk about uh, this evening. So let's kick off with lesson one. Do you, do you like the way they disappeared? I'm very proud of these slides. I'll just go back again and show you that. Isn't that fantastic? I've only just worked out how to do that. I'll show you some more in a few minutes' time. So let's look at nucleic acids first and what they are. And we'll go right the way back to the beginning. And I show this slide in all of my lectures on uh, nucleic acids. And this is uh, Watson and Crick. This is Crick. And this is his PhD student, Watson, when they produced their fantastic model of deoxyribose nucleic acid right back in 1953. And I've got here the original paper that they published in Nature which still gives me a sort of tingly feeling down my spine. I just read the last bit of it, or the, the end of the first paragraph. We wish to suggest a structure for the salt of deoxyribose nucleic acid, which we propose to call DNA. What an amazing sentence. <laughs> and then they go on to say, this structure has novel features. Novel. It was completely new. This is British understatement at its best. Novel features which is con are of considerable biological interest. It changed the way we thought about science. And that's all that they could say. I just think it's wonderful. I want to just explore DNA just for a few minutes to look at what it is, how it works, and how some of the things I'm going to talk about uh, can be explained in terms of DNA and some of the new things that we're seeing around interactions with DNA. We all know the structure of DNA is the double helix. I love this picture of the double helix. I want to look at how it's made up and what components of this double helix are important in the story that I'm going to tell you. Chemistry. I've done it already. How long did that take me? That took me four minutes, 25 seconds, and I've got into chemistry. Now, we can just lock the back door, if you don't mind, to keep the audience in at this stage. So don't, don't worry about the chemical structures, but I just want to have a feel for how these things work. So just looking back at that structure that I showed you a few seconds ago, these are basically a whole load of sugar molecules with phosphate groups off the side of them. And these are DNA bases which bond to other DNA bases and hold this double helix together. And if we look in a little bit more detail, because it's quite important for my story to understand this, these are the structures of the sugars here. These are the phosphate groups on them. And this is the backbone bit, which if we go back to the original one, is that bit there. And on the side are these bases. And for DNA, the bases are adenine, cytosine and guanine, A, C and G. 
and they have different molecular structures. And the shape of those molecular structures in, is crucially important in the way they function and how they hold the two halves of DNA together. And I'll look at that as well in a little bit more uh, detail in a few seconds' time. So if we just expand that structure of DNA a little bit. So here's the... I love all these pictures. I've nicked these. Isn't it wonderful now, Google? You just Google something. And you get all these fantastic pictures that are probably copyrighted and someone's going to get me for showing them a little bit later on. So here's the double helix of DNA. And this is just a detailed section of it, basically. One of these sections magnified. Don't worry about the major, main, major, group, major groups. We're not worried about those uh, yet. A little bit later on, I'll talk about those. So here are those individual bases, A and T, G and C. And they bind specifically. So A can only bind to T, and I'm going to talk about that in more detail later too. And C can only bind to, uh, G can only bind to C. So there's only two possible ways that DNA could combine in that way. And that's crucially important in the structure of DNA. It's crucially important in making that helix because you need those two halves bound together. And just to sort of preempt what I'll mention later, you can see between A and T we've got two dotted lines. And for the chemists amongst you, they're hydrogen bonds. They're holding those two bases together. And I'll show you in more detail that later too. And between G and C, you can see there are three dotted lines, and they're hydrogen bonds. So the difference between the binding of A and T and G and C is this has got two hydrogen bonds, and that's got three hydrogen bonds. And that means that a T, are you still with me? That a T can't bind to an A. Sorry? You mentioned A, G, and C, but what's the T? T is another base called thymine. But we're not, thymine, we're not going to talk about the individual structures of these until a little bit later on. So basically, a T can only bind to an A, and a C can only bind to a G. So they're the only options in this. So that's a take-home message, really, for, for this uh, short section. So that's DNA, what it looks like, complex chemical structure, double helix, held together by bases. The bases specifically bind to each other because they've got a specific number of chemical bonds, hydrogen bonds, between them. Now let's look at the chromosome, because that's a very important too. So here's a picture of some chromosomes. I think these are human chromosomes and you can see the standard picture that you see with a sort of X shape held together in the middle by a thing called the centromere. And if you look in greater detail at those chromosomes, the chromosomes are a bundle of DNA basically supercoiled. So this blue line here is a DNA helix and it's sort of packed in a supercoil that's pushed together. So there's an awful lot of DNA in a chromosome. There are many, 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 many metres of DNA in a chromosome pushed into a shape like this that you need a microscope to see. So that's four, five times ten to the minus six metres, that piece there. So that's about the size of a chromosome. And here's the centromere holding it all together. So what are genes? It's going quite well so far, we're not going too slowly. So what are genes? We've come down from DNA, we've shown that the chromosome is made of DNA, and you know that genes are part of the chromosome. So let's look at how genes uh, fit onto the chromosomal structure. <coughs> so here again, courtesy of good old Google, here we've got a lovely, I've drawn some of the pictures myself later, and I'll tell you when they are because I'm very proud of them. Here's a chromosome, and we've just unraveled some of its DNA here. And here's the structure of DNA. And on that chromosome, parts of the DNA form genes. So this might be a gene, that bit of DNA. And that gene codes, and we'll talk about coding in a minute, for a particular protein. And that protein has a particular function. So you're all sitting there at the moment. You're all making, exposing genes. You're all producing proteins from your genes while you sit there. You're doing it at a sort of fairly low level at the moment because you're not particularly active. Nothing much is going on. Your brains are working quite hard, I would think, at the moment. So you, you, uh, you're activating genes that are producing neurotransmitters at the moment, I would think. Within that gene, and this, I don't know whether we need this level of complexity, really, but I've got quite interested in this recently, and so I thought I'd tell you about it. There are two sorts of DNA, a thing called an exon and a thing called an intron. And the exon is actually the bit of DNA that's important for coding for the protein with a function. And the um, intron is junk DNA, basically. But I've been told never to say that again. 
I submitted a paper to a journal recently with junk DNA and they insisted I took it out. But basically, it's junk DNA. It doesn't code for a protein, but we know, and I can't go into the de details of this, that it has roles in protecting the gene. Uh, if, for example, there's something that damages DNA, there's an awful lot of introns, and they might get preferentially damaged. So it might protect the rest of the DNA. Very interesting um, concept. And if you look at the way those introns are, um, those introns and ectrons are actually transferred into protein, I'll show you that later, they separate it at the point at which um, they're converted into proteins. So the next question we've got to ask, because we've looked at DNA, we've talked a bit about that, we've looked at the chromosome, which you all know, and now we know it's made of DNA, and we've looked at what a gene is on that chromosome. It's a finite bit of DNA composed of some junk DNA and some useful DNA that are converted into proteins, or read into proteins, translated into proteins. So how is that reading done? So how is that gene read, and how is it converted into a protein? Now, I mentioned the intron and exon before. At this stage, you should just sit back and think, isn't it amazing that this happens? Isn't it amazing it doesn't go wrong? Well, it does. And that's what I'm going to talk about later. This is a complex process with lots of places it can go wrong. And that's some of the stuff I want to uh, talk about a little bit later. Here's a piece of uh, nucleic acid. We're going to talk about what sort of nucleic acid it is later. It's a messenger uh, RNA but I'll talk about that later. And it's got introns and exons, introns and exons. And basically, the introns are excised, they're cut out, they're taken away, broken down, and recycled into bases and sugars so that they can be utilised again so that we don't waste them. Then the exons, the bits of gene that are coding for uh, a proton, protein rather, are joined together and then translated into that protein. And I'm going to talk about that translation process in a few minutes' time. So this pre-mRNA has the introns and exons, introns and exons, and it's converted into mRNA where the introns are taken out and just the gene is put in ready to be translated into the protein with the use that we need from that particular gene, whatever it might be. That process of um, producing messenger RNA, that specific RNA, I'll tell you about now, but then I'm going to try and put the whole thing together and show you how proteins made in the nucleus. Then we're going to start looking at what effects some of the things we eat might have on these. This is a lovely uh, Time magazine cover because it just illustrates this so well. It illustrates exactly how we make uh, messenger RNA, which is the message with the gene on it, from the DNA, which is sitting in your nucleus, storing all of that information in the middle of your cell. And basically, the DNA simply unzips, and I'll show you this in a few minutes' time, and then each of the teeth on the zip are basically the bases. And then you can make another strand of nucleic acid, which is a messenger RNA, which has the opposite bases that, co that can bind to the bases on DNA, with one different one that we're not going to talk about because it doesn't really matter. And then that piece of messenger RNA is actually what goes out into the cell to make the proteins. So let's have a look at how that uh, happens. So here's the unzipping process. It needn't be at the end of the DNA. The picture I just showed was it unzipping at the end. This is unzipped in the middle, basically. So we've got sort of a, a bit of the DNA where the base pairs have undone. And we produce this little piece of uh, RNA, and it has the opposite bases to uh, the DNA. So here we've got a C and G with their three hydrogen bonds. And to confuse completely, we've got a new base called uracil. I knew you'd ask me. Where does the U come from? That's another base called uracil. Because uh, in RNA, we don't have um, the T. We have U to replace it. Not going into the reasons for that. Uh, it doesn't really matter. And the enzyme that does this is called RNA polymerase. And it basically comes along, locks onto the uh, DNA, and starts chugging along reading the DNA and producing uh, an RNA transcript. And that RNA transcript then comes out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm, where it can be, uh, is the basis of protein um, manufacture or protein uh, synthesis. 
fantastic process. Again, you know, just think. This isn't a mechanical cartoon that just for me to talk to you about. It's actually happening in you now. You're all making proteins in exactly this way. And you can see that quite a lot could go wrong uh, with that process. So why is base pairing specific? I've sort of explained that. But for the chemists amongst you, um, this is why. I mentioned cytosine and guanine have three hydrogen bonds. They have three hydrogen bonds because they've got particular chemical groups that can form hydrogen bonds with each other. So cytosine here might be on the one side of the DNA, and guanine here is on the other side of the DNA, and there's the chemical links between them. Similarly, for thymine and adenine, they have two hydrogen bonds because they have appropriate chemical groups for those hydrogen bonds. So thymine might be over here, and adenine might be over here, and they produce their two. And this, just for completeness, for the lady in the second row here, uh, this is uracil, and it replaces thymine, and you can see the similarities, and it, it produces two hydrogen bonds to adenine in just the same way. So it just shows you the way the chemistry goes on. That chemistry can't go any other way. So that's an absolute uh, fact. Now, if you look at those individual bases on the DNA, they actually form what are called codons. And each one of these codons of three bases codes for an amino acid in a protein. So basically, this is the gene, and this is the genetic code on that gene. This is all making some sort of sense. Yep. Because tell me to go faster or slow down. Nobel laureates want me to speed up, and other people might want me to slow down. So these codons code for amino acids, and the bases in those codons are specific for individual amino acids. And we'll have a look at that in a little bit more detail. Now, as I always tell my students, I want you to learn this, please, and there'll be <laughs> questions on this at the end. This is indeed the genetic code, which is simple as anything, isn't it? You can't believe there's so little in the genetic code. So just to give you some examples, I do me, I'm going to ask questions at the end of them. Uh, UUU, for example, uracil, 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 on the messenger RNA that comes off the DNA, codes for phenylalanine, which is a specific amino acid. UUC, uracil, uracil, cytosine, codes for the same amino acid. So... We've got more codons than we have amino acids. So one co two codons will code for one amino acid very often. And usually, it's just the first two bases that are important in the coding. And the last one can be variable. Not always, but can be variable. And that helps as well, because if there's some error in trans uh, transcription, then there's less chance of there being an error in amino acids. So it's sort of inbuilt way of trying to decrease the number of errors. It doesn't always work, as you'll see later. There are some al also some very important codes, UAA, which is called ochre, and UAG, which is called amber. I don't know why they're called that, actually. Somebody probably knows. Do you know why? You look clever. No? That's no good. <laughs> and they're stop codes. So basically, when the replicative process gets to one of them, it stops and starts making a different protein, proton, protein. So you can see they're really crucially, crucially important. And you can see all of the other uh, codons there as well. So how do we get these amino acids associated with the piece of mRNA that's made from this DNA and goes out into the uh, nucleus? They're actually transported, and this is even more fantastic. I drew this, by the way. <laughs> Could, should we look at it for a while? Can you tell? <laughs> the answer is no, we can't tell. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty bad, isn't it? But it, it tells the story, I think. This is called transfer RNA, which is a little tiny piece of RNA, which has an amino acid attached to one end. And it really does have this weird sort of clover leaf shape on the end of it. And at the other end, it has an anticodon. So it has three bases that code or bind to the three bases that code for the particular amino acid. So this comes along, I'll show you more detail in a minute, binds to the messenger RNA and leaves the amino acid behind. And then another one comes along, binds to the next codon and leaves a different amino acid behind. And they're all joined together by an enzyme making peptide bonds. And at the end of the day, you've got this big long string of amino acids and it all folds up to make a protein. Damn clever. I mean, you couldn't invent that if you tried, I don't think. We do this in the lab now. You know, we do this stuff all the time, which still amazes me. It doesn't amaze all my students, though, because they've grown up with it. So here's the whole process. Now, if that doesn't confuse you, nothing. I didn't draw this, by the way. 
So just to remind you, just go through the whole thing, so you see the whole thing fitting together. Here's the DNA, this is the nucleus, this is the cytoplasm in the cell, and that's a nuclear pore, which is a hole in the membrane around the nucleus. So in the nucleus we've got the DNA, and the DNA is unzipping to make messenger RNA, and the messenger RNA is coming out of the nucleus, and in the process those exons and introns are being excised and all the exons are joined together to make a proper piece of mRNA. That mRNA then comes along to an organelle which is in the cytoplasm of the cell called a ribosome and that ribosome effectively goes along reading the codons in threes and all of the transfer RNAs are sitting out there with their individual amino acids attached to them and the appropriate transfer RNA that fits the codons, comes down and latches on and adds another amino acid to the increasingly lengthy chain of amino acids and that's the protein. So you can see that the code on this DNA, the sequence of bases, determines the sequence of amino acids in the protein. And so the protein is decided upon by the genes in that, um, in that DNA. So, that was the lesson. It took me a bit of a long time to do that, but it's got us to a stage now where we can begin to look what happens when it goes wrong, and this is the quite exciting bit. The beginning is what we know, and the second bit is what I think we might know if you come back in two or three years' time. So, what happens if something goes wrong? Big question. I drew this. You can tell. The simplistic ones I drew. So, here's a piece of mRNA. Here are the individual codons. Here are the amino acids they code for. Here's the protein sequence, 1, 2, 4, 6, 1, 3, 2, 3, 1, 6, whatever those amino acids are, just to make the point that the order is important. If you change one of those bases, it's called a mutation. So if we replace, say, uh, a uracil with a guanine or something like that, or we change the structure of one of those bases because a chemical interferes with it in some way or reacts with it and makes it be read as the wrong uh, base, then we might change what that codon codes for. I should really have put that one at the front because it'd be much more important if it was at the front. So here, instead of coding now for, pro, uh, for amino acid 1, it codes for amino acid 2. So the old protein sequence with the correct gene has now been slightly modified to produce a mutation, a mutated protein with a different amino acid in it. Now, 99.99999% of times, that doesn't make any difference. You're all mutating as you sit here. Go and sit in the sun, you mutate like crazy. You produce mis, uh, misstructured proteins with a few amino acids wrong. It doesn't make any difference. But if that amino acid happened to be a really important part of the protein, it was in its active site, if it was an enzyme or some structural or binding part of the protein, then it could make a really big difference. And it could be bad news. It could mean that the protein doesn't work properly and you drop dead. Not very likely. Or it could mean that the protein works better and then it's the basis of evolution. And that's the basis of Darwinian evolution, which I'm going to ret return to right at the very end. But the take-home message from this is that if you change the bases, you change the protein, and that can change the protein's function, but it doesn't usually, but it can. So let's have a look at some things that do, just to give examples of chemicals that might interfere with DNA and might change those bases in some way that change the proteins that they produce and cause some sort of health effects. Now these are all very well known and I give the first example of cigarette smoke containing this lovely uh, chemical called benzoapyrene which as my students know is one of my favourite chemicals of all time and this chemical happens to be changed in the body to uh, a molecule with very reactive groups and I'm not going to talk about that now, it doesn't matter but it's not this that does what I'm going to talk about. It's a molecule with extra groups sticking off it that you um, put on in your lungs, actually. So if we look at DNA, this molecule is very flat, incredibly flat, and it, here it is. It can actually sit in the structure of DNA and go right into the centre of it. And if it does that, it can change the way the gene is expressed. This might be a gene here and it might be mis-expressed. And if, for example, that gene coded for a protein that controlled the way cells divide, and there is one such protein, very important protein, P53, 
then it might upregulate that so that you increase the rate at which cells divide, the frequency at which cells divide. We commonly call that cancer. And that's exactly what benzoapyrene does. It causes an upregulation of a gene that increases the growth of cells. And so it causes cancer, and it causes cancer in the lung because that's where this stuff is. You breathe it in. And so it has major effects in the lung. But if it gets to other places in the body, it will cause cancer there too. And if you look at the incidence of cancer in smokers, you'll see that lung cancer is the biggie, but then kidney cancer, liver cancer, brain cancer, blah, blah, blah. loads of other cancers too, much lower rates because this doesn't get as easily to them as it did to the DNA in the lung. Now, you might think this is a sort of fictitious little diagram that I've nicked from Google. This is actually a real um, representation of an X-ray crystallograph for the chemists amongst you of DNA crystallised in the presence of benzoapyrene. So you can see exactly where it goes. So that, that isn't just an illustration. It's actually taken from data from an X-ray crystallograph. So there's the product of that horrible chemistry. And there's a nice... Uh, lung cancer, and these cells are just growing uncontrollably in that region. Can't go into the detail of that. I'd love to talk more about lung cancer, because it's quite interesting, isn't it? Why it kills you? You know, it's not that big. OK, it takes over a good proportion of the lung, or it can, but often people die before it does that, because it produces other chemicals, other hormones that control other cells that stop you metabolising normally and properly. But there are many other chemicals that do very similar things, and they're associated with food. And I want to talk about some of those and then move on to chemicals that cause changes that are nothing to do with these fundamental changes in DNA, but just very light touch changes around the edge of DNA that cause what we now believe to be very fundamental effects. So here's a very nice molecule called sorolin, one of my favourites. And sorolin, nice flattish sort of structure, a bit kinky at the end here, but it can actually sit into DNA and have a similar sort of effect. And I'll talk about how the effect occurs a bit later on. Does anybody, yeah, some of you know where this is. No, I'm not going to ask because there's people who are going to know the answer to that question. But that's where it is. It's in parsnips. And it's in parsnips at fairly high concentrations, actually. doesn't mean you shouldn't eat parsnips. I love giving these sort of lectures because people stop eating things. <laughs> and I gave a talk in the States about this. They don't eat parsnips at all in the States. Nobody knew what it was, even. <laughs> So then I talked about Brussels sprouts, and the market for Brussels sprouts <laughs> dropped. <laughs> so solar is present in, in parsnips, and it's a phytoalexin. It's a, a chemical that's produced by parsnips and celery and carrots to some extent as well, and um, parsley in very high concentrations. It's produced in response to damage. So if there's some damage, there's a bit damaged there on the parsnip, it produces some of this to kill fungi, and uh, it's also insecticidal, so that when it's damaged, it doesn't get uh, attacked by fungi. But in the meantime, if you eat that parsnip, then you'll get a dose of this. And after a bit of chemistry, photoactivation in the skin cells, it can uh, cause cancer. Now, that doesn't mean that if you eat a parsnip, you're going to get cancer. Of course it doesn't. It's just part of the risks associated with chemicals in food. Parsnips al also contain a whole load of things that stop you getting cancer. So if you balance the whole lot, parsnips are perfectly OK to eat. But it's a nice example of a chemical present in the food that we eat. Now, if you knew the way I make slides, the fact there's a little bit down the corner here means there's a hell of a lot more to come. And you should look at the... Isn't that fantastic? I've got this sus now. So here's another one, These, just in case you don't recognise them. These are peanuts. And this is a molecule called aflatoxin M1, which is present in peanuts. This causes cancer too. It causes mutational changes in primary DNA, which leads, leads to a, a misreading and a production of an mRNA that uh, doesn't produce the right transcript. You see all those words I can say now. And uh, I can, we can all speak the same language. And this molecule's present in peanuts that have gone mouldy. It's not present in normal peanuts at all, only mouldy peanuts. And the levels of it are actually regulated because of the amount of peanuts that we eat in New Zealand and other countries in the world are quite great. And therefore there's a limit to the amount of this molecule that there is allowed to be in peanuts, and particularly peanut butter. And so companies manufacture their peanut butter and blend it so that the final product has a lower level of this than the statutory limit. The levels of it going up, actually, in our diet, and the reason they are is that we're buying peanuts from places now that don't look after them properly. If you buy peanuts from Australia, good old Aussie peanuts, 
They're kept in dry conditions, grown in dry conditions. Molds don't grow very well. If you buy peanuts from more humid countries uh, like China and Brazil, then there's more chance of them being mouldy and therefore there's a greater chance of having higher levels of aflatoxin. But that's another chemical that causes a mutational change, just like the sorolin and just like benzoapyrene in cigarette smoke. I think there's room in there for another one. Oh, yes. All the things you love. Bacon. Isn't that lovely? It looks quite nice, doesn't it? Nice piece of bacon. It's got this fantastic chemical called dimethyl nitrosamine, which is one of the most carcinogenic chemicals we know. It binds directly to guanine, G, in uh, DNA and changes its structure. And G gets misread as something else. And it will change millions upon millions of Gs in a strand of DNA. Interestingly, uh, this dimethyl nitrosamine isn't actually present in bacon, but bacon is cured with nitrate and nitrite. And it, nitrosamines are produced by reaction between uh, nitrite and a part of an amino acid uh, molecule catalyzed by bacteria in the gut. So you've got loads of amino acids in your gut. You take in the nitrate and nitrite in the bacon, and the bacteria do the rest for you. You then absorb the dimethyl nitrosamine. And it causes tumours in many organs, particularly in the liver and kidney, because they're the two places that it gets to first. As soon as that's absorbed, it's taken up by the hepatic portal vein to the liver, where it has an effect on the liver. Then the liver excretes it into the blood circulatory system to be excreted via the kidney, and it gets to the kidneys second. So they're the two um, areas of tumorigenesis that you get. So you're probably thinking this is all doom and gloom. There is no hope for us. Well, there is, because you're still all here. And you haven't got lumps and bumps all over you, and you've probably eaten bacon, and you've eaten parsnips, and you've, some of you have had a cigarette, and, and so, you know, you're all OK. And the reason for that is that DNA is repaired. And, in fact, DNA is the only molecule in the, in the body, in any cell, that's repaired, because it's so important. It holds all the information about you, and therefore there are major repair mechanisms. This is a very boring lecture that I give to the undergraduates about uh, repair of DNA, and I'm going to do it in three seconds now. It's like one of those potted Shakespeare's. Here's a strand of DNA, and here, this is too simplistic, I'm sorry about this, but here's a, a complex of enzymes that constantly surveys the DNA, checking for any inaccuracies. So, for example, if in this DNA we'd got a little piece of something in there, like benzoapyrene from cigarette smoke, or sorolin, or um, dimethyl nitrosamine that's bound to, say that's guanine, it's bound to guanine, the base pairing won't be good because the, the DNA is pushed apart by the chemistry of interaction between those molecules. And it makes a little sort of blip on the surface here. And these enzymes, this system, recognises there's something wrong. So what does it do? Very clever. It actually takes out some of the bases on one part of the DNA and replaces them with new bases. And it replaces them with the right bases to match the bases on the other side, <coughs> which is why DNA is double-stranded, so that the other half is there to allow the repair mechanism to say, I'm going to put the right bases back in. Great, fantastic, you've repaired it, but sometimes that goes wrong. And sometimes this fantastic enzyme system just gets it wrong and puts the wrong base in. And that might, in its own right, cause the tr translation to the wrong protein, might increase cell division, might cause cancer, might produce an enzyme that doesn't work, might produce a protein that doesn't bind properly, or whatever. But 99.99, I'm making that number up, percent of times, it repairs the DNA and makes it better. So that's conventional. That's conventional mutation. That's what we know about. Thousands of scientific papers on it. There are even journals, one of the most prestigious journals in the world is called Mutation Research. Now I want to just look at some other aspects of um, DNA damage. And these are really rather new. And this is around methylation and a, a new area of science called epigenetics. And I'm just sort of getting interested in this. So this is something that I'm just beginning to get interested in. So what I'm telling you is at the very noddiest level here. This is just about the level I've got to. And I'm working on it at the moment. So let's just have a little bit of a look at this. So here's your double-stranded DNA. Here are the bases. Here they are hydrogen bonded together. What happens in methylation, or in epigenetics, which we'll talk about in a minute, is that instead of putting a different base in or changing the base overtly, 
just a simple methyl group is added to those bases. Now, I can't go into the detail of this because it's too much of a long story, but methylation is a very important process in DNA because methylation occurs along the strand of DNA to tell the cell which is the older strand of DNA. And that's been known for many years. So when that repair mechanism comes along, it's looking for the old side of DNA, and that's the side that's methylated. And it will assume, this sounds like a human, doesn't it? It's an enzyme. It'll assume that that's correct. So this process of methylation has been known for a long time in that context. But we're beginning to see now that if you get different amounts of methylation, different sequences, sort of a methylation, non-methylation, methylation, six non-methylations, 12 methylations, it signals to the cell to do something specific with that DNA. And what we're also beginning to see now is that there are large pieces of DNA which are in the intron, which is why I'm told not to call it junk anymore, that actually are specifically methylated. And they're called methylation rafts. And they're sort of thought of as sort of floating in the DNA, basically. And they're the place that the replicative apparatus joins onto to begin translating uh, a strand of DNA. We'll look at this in a little bit more detail. That methylation process then involves the base cytosine, and it just sticks a methyl group just into this position for the chemists amongst you. It's a tiny change, but a very, very important change. And if you look at what might happen with that methylation uh, process, if, for example, you've got a sperm and uh, some methylation changes in the DNA in that sperm, or, and, could be both, or either, in an egg, you've got a piece of DNA with some methylation changes in, what happens to them? This is where we sort of don't know properly yet, but I can show you some evidence uh, in a few minutes' time. And we know part of what happens. If that sperm fertilises that egg and one or both of them have got methylation changes in, we know, strangely, can't understand this, somebody does, I haven't read the paper yet, that methyl group is taken off and a hydroxyl group is put on. Now, until recently, we thought that the methyl group was lost and it was a sort of repair and it was all put right so that the zygote produced by these, this fertilising this, didn't have the methylation any longer. But actually, it's, it has that hydroxyl group. For the point of view of our discussion today, it doesn't matter. All it means is that that change is still there, but it's slightly different. So I've actually put the stars on there, by the way. This, you see the expertise now. I'm able to doctor somebody else's uh, pictures. So these stars represent those hydroxyl groups. All getting a bit too, too much detail uh, now, but basically what I'm saying is, Methylation marks, as they're called, can be transmitted to a, uh, to a fertilised egg uh, in the zygote. So the question then is, what happens? Because that zygote then forms an embryo. And that embryo has got these methylation marks in it. And these methylation marks signal something about a gene. They might say, switch me on, switch me off. Make proteins from me, don't make proteins from me. So by not changing the DNA, by changing the base sequence, but just by changing it with methylation, we can actually signal to the fetus to do something different. So the fetus, I love these pictures, aren't they great? So the fetus, I've tried to get a picture of me when I was a baby, see if anyone recognised me, actually. <laughs> but the only one we've got, my mum and dad had taken, you know, back in 1950, God knows when. And it had this very bare bottom, and it was just too embarrassing. <laughs> and until my mum died, she said, she's not changed. <laughs> Don't know how she knew. But there we go. So this baby now has reproduced all of its cells. And as I showed you, when you reproduce the DNA, you produce the same opposite numbers of bases. So it's reproduced those methylation marks in its cells. So those methylation marks are all there, saying, switch me on, switch me off, switch me on, switch off, whatever. So the question is... What happens as that child grows up in its development? It could grow up into something very weird. This is all courtesy of the web. That's John Key, if you didn't recognise, with a quite unusual hairstyle. And this is one of the products of methylation marks. I personally am all for getting rid of them, but there we go, we can't do that. But this is all fantasy at the moment. 
But I want to look at some reality, because there is some reality around this. And these, are, these aren't any experiments that I've done. These are from the literature. And it's a classic experiment that was carried out just a few years ago. And these mice are different colours, as you can see. And they range from a yellowy colour to this thing called pseudo agouti. I don't know why it's called that, but it is. And it's sort of browny, mottly uh, colour. And there's all shades in between. Now, until quite recently, these were thought to be mutations. They're not. These have got differences in methylation marks. And so the methylation marks are actually upregulating the enzymes that make the different dyes that make their uh, fur a different colour. And basically, the degree of methylation goes up as the colour gets more yellow. So the methylation is saying, switch on the yellow dye-making apparatus. And the lack of methylation is saying, switch off the yellow dye-making apparatus, which means that the basic colour of the animal will be shown, and that's the brown colour. That's quite fantastic, I think, that that can happen. Interestingly, and I can't go about, on about this in detail, if you breed these mice together, they slowly lose the colour differentiation as the methylation marks are repaired, which actually doesn't happen with mutations. So this is quite different. So just a few generations, and these methylation marks will disappear, and the animals will go back to whatever their wild-type uh, colour was. Now, there's a chemical I'm quite interested in, <coughs> and I can't go into this in detail either, but I'd love to. And this is a chemical called benzoapyrene. Uh, not benzoapyrene, this is bisphenol A, sorry. And this is a, a, a plasticizer, a chemical used in the manufacture of polycarbonate plastics. And I write a lot about this and get into trouble about what I write. And it's well known to be a feminizing chemical because it fits into the estrogen receptor. But it also, if you dose it to these animals before pregnancy, does something really rather interesting. Because the higher the dose of bisphenol A, the more chance you've got of producing a yellow mouse. So that means that the bisphenol A is changing the amount of methylation. Now we can show that quite clearly, and it's been shown very well, because we can measure the amount of methylation on DNA reasonably easily now. I mean, it's not something you do every day, but it's reasonably easy to do. Uh, we do, do, I'm doing it in collaboration with some people at the uh, medical school at the moment down in, uh, in Christchurch. And we can show that if the dose of bisphenol A is high, the amount of methylation is higher, and therefore the yellowness is increased. So we know that that can occur, and we know a chemical can cause that. This chemical could well be in food, especially if you package your food in plastics that are made from bisphenol A. So if you get a dose of bisphenol A, it will change your methylation marks. Whether they have any effect on you, I don't know. But in theory, if it changes the methylation marks in your offspring, it could have an effect on them. But it might not, I don't know. And that's genuine, I haven't got a clue. But it might. But let me just show you some evidence, which is a bit controversial, actually, and I've been lambasted for this recently. And I'll, I'll be honest when I get to the bits that people are lambasting me about. But these talks are supposed to be about what if, not the past and what's happened. This is very much at the minute. The Malayan emergency, which uh, occurred between the mid-1950s and the early-ish 1960s, involved quite a lot of New, Zealand, uh, New Zealanders. And they were stationed in Malaya. And I've been doing some work on these veterans quite recently. And they're the most wonderful people I've met for many years. Th these are men in their 80s and some in their 90s. And they come along and talk about their experiences and let me take bits off them and fill in questionnaires and all sorts of stuff for my research. And I'll just show you some of the results that we've got. But before I do, I just want to talk about something that they do. And this is a picture that one of them sent to me, of, of him actually, um, in the jungle in uh, Malaya in the 1957, I think this was, when I was just one. And they are applying something to their clothes. And they're applying to their clothes this chemical called dibutyl phthalate. And this is a very interesting molecule that's got a lot of science behind it. And I'm very interested in this molecule. And the reason they're doing it is because of this fantastic creature called a trombiculid mite, which bites and it transmits a disease called bush typhus. And now, the blokes out in the, in the jungle don't want a dose of bush typhus because it makes you pretty ill. And that's not the best thing to get when you're trying to fight uh, the enemy, basically. So they use this chemical, which tills, kills the tick. But they actually applied it, you can't see them doing it, to the seams of their clothes because the tick actually gained access to their skin by going through the stitching in their seams. So by putting this chemical on the seams, they, they killed the creature before it got in. See how they're doing it? They're just putting the hand in, in the liquid 
and rubbing it on their clothes. So their exposure to this chemical was really quite high. Now, what happens if you give a mouse or a rat dibutyl phthalate? This is very well shown in the literature, and uh, it's very well known. There's nothing new about this. If you give dibutyl phthalate, the chemical that the, Malay, the Malayan veterans put on their, New Zealand Malayan veterans put on their uh, clothes, the, to the mother, the pups, the offspring, have lower levels of testosterone in their testes. That's weird. How can that happen? And it, for many years, we've known this is the case, but it's actually quite difficult to explain it. And I want to talk a little bit about this, and you'll see why this is a really important finding uh, that fits in with the idea of methylation marks. I looked in uh, the Malaysian veterans in their children to see if they'd got any disorders that might be associated with low levels of testosterone, because that would fit in with the studies that have been shown in mice. Now, these data are very controversial. They were published just at the end of last year by my honour student, Matt Caron, and myself in the New Zealand Medical Journal. And there have been so many letters in the journal, it sparked a whole new revolt, I think, saying, sure, doesn't know what he's talking about. This is rubbish. It's ridiculous. It's awful. But the outcome has been that the effect that I'm going to talk about appears to be happening, but the magnitude of it might be wrong because of some errors that I might have made in the calculations. We're all, the jury's out on this at the moment. And this is the way science works. You know, we all argue and kill each other, and then we slowly make friends and have a beer and all agree. And we're on the thinking about having a beer at this stage, I think. So if you look at two diseases, and I'll tell you what these are, cryptorchidism, which is undescended testes, the hiding of the testis, cryptos from the Greek, orchidos meaning testis, and hyperspadius, which is a disease in men where the urethra comes out of the side of the penis instead of the end of it. And I'm going to talk about why that's so important in a few minutes' time. If you look in the normal New Zealand population, I've only shown some data here. The incidence in 2000 was about 1.09%. In 2005, it was 0.91%. So they're about the same. They don't change much. The background incidence is about the same. And hyperspadias, 0.33 and 0.3, doesn't change much. And if you look at all the years in between and the years after, they're all around about the same. The incidence in our populations were very much higher. These numbers, I think, are probably too high. And for those of you who are epidemiologists, and I'm not, which is what someone pointed out in the New Zealand Medical Journal the other day, this man is not an epidemiologist, stick to your knitting, basically, um, will know that if you work out incidence, I'd worked out the incidence in a particular population. It should be the incidence in the population per year, which means that that number's lower. But the numbers are still statistically significantly different to those. So there's an increased incidence of cryptorchidism and an increased incidence of hyperspadias in those children of the men that were exposed to dibutyl phthalate. One of the other arguments against this is they might have been exposed to other stuff too. We don't know. I've only looked at one thing, and it might be the other things doing this. We're looking at that now, and I'll show you some data that suggests it's not the case. There were, yes. And we've looked at the women as well, but we couldn't find anything significant because there's a very small number of them. I think we only had about 10 in our cohort, so it's too small. You, your um, slide showed if you gave that chemical to the female rat. Yes. Okay, so the offspring, etc. Yep. <coughs> you're talking about the blokes, so we've not got to that part. Uh, that's where I'm coming to next, yeah. If you give it to male rats, their testosterone level goes down as well but I don't think anybody's given it to male rats and then bred off them. That's what we're hoping to do next. So if you look at why testosterone synthesis is really important. So testosterone is the male hormone. I'm going to show you all the chemistry of this in a minute, so be prepared. These are bigger molecules than I've shown you before. There's a thing in the embryo called the urogenital fold, and this is, I'm, I'm again, not an anatomist either. But the urogenital fold actually makes either the vagina or the penis according to which way it folds. This is really simplistic. If it folds inwards, it's a vagina. If it folds outwards, it's a penis, basically. And to make the female organs, estrogen's important, and to make the male organs, androgen, which testosterone is an androgen, is important. It's not this simple. It's much more complex. But this is sort of the basis of it. So if you're a male and you've got a lower level of that, you're not going to go as far down that route as you might and you might produce an organ that's somewhere between the two. 
undescended testes is exactly that, and the urethra coming out of the side of the penis is exactly that, because it's the folding that's gone wrong during that process. So that sort of fits in, in theory. Now, look at that, fantastic. This is another one of the uh, questions at the end. Good Lord. The synthesis of testosterone, don't worry about the whole thing, I just want to show you how the way it's synthesized. Testosterone is made from cholesterol. They tell you it's bad. Blokes, eat your cholesterol. <laughs> <laughs> you need testosterone. It's made from cholesterol down this route, which produces testosterone. Several steps. Cholesterol also is used to synthesize a whole series of glucocorticoid uh, hormones which are involved in maintaining glucose levels in the blood and in the liver and so on and a lot of other functions too. And there's one particular glucocorticoid that's rather important and that's cortisol. So if you block that, the cholesterol is going to go down this way and produce cortisol. If you block that, the cholesterol is going to go down that way and produce more testosterone. That's my simple mind uh, at work. Biochemistry is more complex than that as people keep telling me. So we decided to look in some cells, in some testicular cells, Leydig cells, from a, a testicular cell line that we're growing, at whether they produce cortisol or testosterone when you gave them dibutyl phthalate, because that would tell us quite a lot. And I think this is really rather interesting. These results we got three days ago, so this is kind of right up to the minute, not published uh, and nowhere near it yet. And these are produced by... Adam Ridden, who's my current master's, one of my master's students, a very bright young bloke. And what he did was, he took some cells, and here's, here's some testicular cells in culture in the background here, and he got them growing. This is no mean feat. It took, it took him about six months to get the process actually working. Then he exposed them to low-ish doses of dibutyl phthalate over a few-day period, and then began to measure whether the cells were making testosterone, as you'd expect them to do, or whether they were making something else. And very interestingly, he, this is a high-performance liquid chromatograph, doesn't matter what that is, but it's a way of analysing the liquid from around these cells. There was a nice big peak for progesterone, and that's a precursor for testosterone, so they were going down that direction. Strangely, you don't need to know this, but the cells that we've got, for reasons we don't understand, don't make testosterone. They stop at progesterone. We're working on that. There's a gene silence being switched off for some reason. But they also made cortisol, which is really interesting. But if you didn't give the cells dibutyl phthalate, they didn't make cortisol. So that's suggesting that in the presence of dibutyl phthalate, they're going down that way and down that way. But probably if we got the dibutyl phthalate dose high enough, they wouldn't go down that route and they'd only go down that route. And this might just begin to explain those changes that we saw in the, um, in the human uh, experiments. But, and this is where the complete fiction starts and complete uncertainty, is this is not a mutation, and we know that. It most definitely isn't. So the only explanation is this is to do with methylation marks. And we've just put in for a big grant to try and study whether methylation is increasing in these cells when they've been exposed to dibutyl phthalate. And I've got another student who's actually working on, the, a joint student who's working on the genes that code for each of these enzymes to try and find out if any of those enzymes are damaged in any way. But why this is really quite interesting, apart from the methylation story, is it might be one of the first examples of a human event that's involving methylation in this way. But also, if you think about it, this is about our exposure to chemicals that are influencing our children. But they're not changing our DNA in a conventional way. And so, if you think about it in... Let's go to the next slide. If you think about it in Darwinian terms, basically Darwin said mutations are the basis of evolution. Quite true, we all accept that. And Lamarck, who was around at the time, and he was ridiculed in all sorts of cartoons, um, because he said that animals develop according to their needs. So he said giraffes have long necks because they needed or wanted to eat the leaves from the top of trees. 
Darwin said, no, 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 that's complete rubbish. They have long necks because they developed genes which made their le necks longer, which meant they could eat from the top of trees. And that was good because the leaves were good and they lived and everything and that was selected in. But methylation marks and methylation processes I talked about are actually rather more like Lamarckian evolution than like Darwinian evolution because they're actually changing the way our cells function according to what we've taken in, in this example, in our diet. It could be what we breathe in, our, in the air or in anything else. So the nurture versus nature argument is probably sort of going a little bit on the nurture side when you think about methylation marks. So the nurture's around experiences, i.e. what you've been exposed to, and the nature's around about genetics, how the genes are actually changed by something, by mis, um, misdirection. So perhaps Lamarck wasn't such a fool after all. If only he'd known about epigenetics, he could have written a paper about it in Nature and said, this is all about epigenetics, and Darwin might not have been as famous as he is now. So what I've tried to do, I hope I've done this, is lead you through quite a complex story to an outcome that we actually don't know what it is yet. But we're just at the sort of spring-off point. And there's a lot of really exciting research going on around the world. And the cost of this sort of research is huge. So people are collaborating in order to try and get the stuff done at the moment. So what I'll do in about two years' time, if we're still doing these lectures, I'll give another one. And I can tell you then whether we did actually show that this was methylation marks and how important those methylation marks might be from the perspective of signalling via your food to your offspring and influencing the way they grow and develop.